everybody hear me and can everyone see the PowerPoint? Both are good. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> so perhaps we might call uh, my larger kind of project I'm working on is like a conceptual history uh, that seeks to answer the question of how a liberal society that values freedom and equality can likewise um, be a society that's captivated, uh, ruined, and disgraced by racial injustice. And so I'll, I offer racial profiling um, that is like the invidious uh, use of race or ethnicity as a criterion in law enforcement's uh, investigative procedures. So I offer racial profiling as one particular mechanism that has been part and parcel of the United States throughout its existence. So its temporality marks it a little differently than other racist practices such as slavery, Jim Crow, and redlining. So in short, it's one racist practice that's been consistent across US history from de jure to de facto white supremacy. Now my focus today is, is kind of zoomed in on the I can't breathe or we can't breathe slogan and actually the work of Franz Fanon. So at the BET Awards, that's Black Entertainment Television for maybe anyone who's not familiar, but in the BET Awards uh, in 2016, Jesse Williams uh, won an award and as he was speaking, he spoke with the the, the lyric of James Baldwin, the righteous rage of bell hooks and Malcolm X. And he says, people of color are quote, done watching and waiting while this invention called whiteness uses and abuses us, bearing black people out of sight and out of mind while extracting our culture, ghettoizing and demeaning our creations, then stealing them, gentrifying our genius and then trying us on like costumes before discarding our bodies like rinds of strange fruit. The thing is though, the thing is that just because we're magic doesn't mean we're not real. In, it, in his acceptance speech, Williams names several people, those who had been sacrificed at the, um, how should I put this, the, the altar of white supremacy, uh, namely Tamir Rice, Rakia Boyd, Sandra Bland, Darian Hunt, William spoke of both cultural appropriation and anti-Black violence while also gesturing towards uh, a concept of the white gaze, which is a hegemonic fixture of racialized surveillance and a quotidian tool for buttressing white supremacy. After the death of Eric Garner in 2014, we saw a steady stream of references to Franz Fanon. A Fanonian slogan emerged on social media and on posters at protests against police violence. And of course, the man himself uttered these words as he was being murdered by police. But Fanon gets quoted also on these, on these signs, on these protest uh, signs. And the quote often attributed to Fanon is something like the following. When we revolt, it's not for a particular culture we revolt simply because for many reasons, we can no longer breathe. So who was this uh, Franz Fanon and why was he being cited decades after his own death? And as you might know, Fanon powerfully brought together in very fecund ways, anti-colonial political theory and activism, psychoanalysis, phenomenology and existential philosophy. But there's a curious fact about this slogan, uh, as it's attributed to Fanon is namely, it's nowhere actually to be found in Fanon's writings, at least not the exact wording that I just gave. And my guess is the slogan is a rewording of a passage near the end of his 1952 black skin white masks in which Fanon writes, quote, it is not because the Indo-Chinese has discovered a culture of his own that he is in revolt. It is because quite simply, it was in more way than one becoming impossible for him to breathe, end quote. And embodiments, you know, that we have a body, that our identity is wrapped up in the body, that we can't separate, say, the body from the soul or the mind or identity. We're embodied creatures. That runs throughout Fanon's work. In The Drowning Eye, which is a play he wrote in 1949, Fanon places the following words on the lips of Lucian. To love you, to love you is to hear you with my hands, to drink you with my hands, 
to taste you with my hands. In the last line, a black skin, white, mo white masks, Fanon prays, oh, my body, make me always a man who questions. And in The Wretched of the Earth from 1963, Fanon suggests that the colonized intellectual most, quote, better display the history of his body. So racism, and we should add colonialism, is sociogenic. Uh, put differently, racism is born out of our social existence rather than found in any kind of essentialist ontology. And today I want to look at one social historical condition for our Manichaean racialized matrix or social matrix, a matrix in which whiteness is both a social position afforded with advantage and a site of terror. There's a synergetic logic grounding racial profiling. Now, synergetic has its roots in the Greek word kunigetikos having to do with, with hunting. And Gregoire Chemayu describes the logic of synergetic power as one according to which those with power, let's say the predators, exert themselves over others, the prey. So the question becomes either how does the predator catch and hold its prey, or how does the predator expel or exclude its prey? In either case, the prey cannot you know, be loose among the social order, since that allegedly would threaten the order. And so the prey might show up as, for example, immigrants, Amerindians, Jews, Arabs, or Black Americans. And in each case, whiteness remains the synergetic sovereign while the social order is, is constructed with whiteness as its transcendental norm. Now at the BET Awards, Williams spoke of this invention called whiteness. Within the social matrix, whiteness functions as the rubric for the quintessential human, for virtue, for truth, for the good. And according to the um, logic of, of epidermal racial classification, white bodies share in the positioning of whiteness, but that position of whiteness extends beyond our epidermal citationality and includes those who protect whiteness as property, for example, the police, regardless of one's race. And as the contracts of the, the racial polity of the US attempts to protect property, whiteness itself becomes property, where Charles Mills, um, a recently deceased uh, friend and mentor of mine, uh, you know, claimed that non-whites do not fully own, sorry, do not fully or at all own themselves. In other words, blackness has a kind of um, instrumental value for whiteness. And in the US, whiteness is therefore defined oppositionally, right? And this is a point made by um, several actual critical race theorists that Charity mentioned, like Derek Bell or, um, uh, or Harris, uh, Crenshaw, et cetera, et cetera, that whiteness, it's defined oppositionally. That is where white equals virtue and citizen, black equals vice and anti-citizen. That is a Caliban needing to be controlled or expelled as a kind of prey. Additionally, property has been understood as a kind of differential entitlement. So if, if whiteness is property, then blackness cannot be. So to be clear, whiteness in this context, while it's not entirely disassociated from epidermal hue, it actually speaks to the material benefits that whiteness confers. In other words, whiteness means that one owns differential treatments in that kind of social sphere matrix. So Caliban is the name I give to the prey, to those who are hunted. And our readers of Shakespeare might recognize this as a reference to the Tempest, in which Caliban is the name of the, is a, of the savage and deformed slave. But in the 20th century, um, a different use of Caliban emerged, one in which Caliban represents the oppressed who suffer under the grip of colonialism and puricism and white supremacy. So it's in that second sense that I, like Aimé Césaire or other theorists of negritude or creadité, uh, use the figure of Caliban. That is as shorthand to name the people of color 
who are reduced to epidermal hue of their bodies. Now, law enforcement agencies then, to kind of connect the dots a little bit, law enforcement agencies, uh, particularly the police, exist as a means of controlling Caliban populations, the prey, in order to unjustly protect whiteness. So it's actually arguably an inherently racist kind of institution. In his BET speech, Williams claimed that whiteness uses and abuses black folks. Today, white supremacist ideology found among average white folks in the US is typically not that whites think they're naturally or essentially superior, although certainly some people think that, but many white people think that as whites, they are neutral and black folks at the same time are then believed to be deviant of that kind of neutral normativity that whiteness confers. So in other words, black people lack the necessary quality for being fully human. They do not have the same social value according to this white supremacist logic. So this gets the, to the normativity in racial ideology. Um, Robert Wesley uh, explains that quote, to the extent that the dominant group escapes racial or ethnic identification, it's free to act as a value-free norm for the rest of the society, end quote. So in other words, whiteness can go, it goes unnamed. So racial identities are um, historically formed by and across uh, a complex series of events throughout Euro modernity. And such constructions are motivated by the political, economic, and cultural interests of the dominant group. So that's not to say that the subordinate group has no agency in shaping its identity or resisting the identity projected by the dominant group onto it, but it is to say that Euro modernity marks a temporal and spatial mapping, a kind of time-stamped cartography in which whiteness is set up as the global transcendental norm for human personhood, and via personhood, the paragon political subject. White supremacy is also synergistic, that is, it exceeds any one particular form of white advantage pulling together into system or into, you know, the system variations of advantage that cut across um, a myriad of individual relationships and institutions. It shows up in policing and political representation, housing and healthcare, education and employment. Whiteness is normative, privileged, afforded rights at the expense of the unmet rights of others and marked by um, at certain kinds of, of um, knowing and certain kinds of ignorance. And what holds these spheres together, that is the juridical, political, cultural, economic, et cetera, what, what holds those spheres together is the white gaze that makes invisible black personhood and makes black bodies hypervisible. The white gaze filters the view, or, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's, a view that filters a whiteness as pure, uh, virtuous, honest, hardworking, rational, uh, and b blackness as deviant, immoral, criminal, lazy, ignorant, capricious. So the white the white gaze functions as both perception and meaning making. What holds these spheres together is the fact that black life is consistently defined by the black body. Um, what holds these spheres together is the fact that Black life is always already known, that is thought to be suspect and given the status of subperson. So the white gaze upon Black bodies attempts to hold Black persons under surveillance. And one use of that is racial profiling by the police. So white gazing, uh, George Yancey, a friend of mine, says, uh, that the white gazing is a specific, let me get this quote right, is a specific um, historical practice. It's socially collective and intersubjective. It's a process that's dutifully maintained, uh, end quote. So used within a 
uh, white supremacist society to dehumanize black folks, the white gaze is both the lens and action through which whites or whiteness views black persons. The white gaze filters that view so that the deviant, sorry, the default way, <laughs> the default way of seeing black persons is as irrevocably other. Put differently, white folks act as seers or knowers, that is, those bearing of epistemic privilege, while black folks are objectified or dingified, to borrow from Aimé Césaire, who is Fanon's teacher. Um, white supremacy attempts to subject black folks to erasure, attempts to rob them of their individuality. And Yancey explains this by synthesizing the notions of invisibility and hypervisibility. So borrowing from black novelist Ralph Ellison, Yancey writes, quote, the invisible man does not know himself as embodied flesh and blood. Excuse me, let me restate that. The invisible man does know himself as embodied flesh and blood, and yet he is invisible. His body is, and yet he is not, end quote. So the, the bad faith of whiteness convinces whites to gaze upon the alleged non-humanity or subhumanity of non-whites. And Ellison has this famous passage about this, right? He's a man of, of substance, and yet he's invisible. People refuse to see him. They will see everything around him and his body, but not him, not his person. And why is he invisible? It's kind of disposition of the eyes, the inner eye, the white perceptions or gaze upon the black body. And that then becomes reality. So under the white gaze, black folks are invisible. That is, they're stripped of their personhood, their humanity uh, is not seen. Uh, they are, as Officer Darren Wilson described Michael Brown, demons. They have no wishes, wants, desires, or beliefs. They're not present as selves. They have no past, they have no future. They have no breath. In short, they are not seen as real. Now under the white gaze, black folks, the Calibans are invisible. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, black folks are invisible. That is, they're, they're stripped of their personhood. Their humanity is not seen. This inner eye, this uh, cognitive distortion, ascribes deviant content to Blackness prior to any individual encounter with any one specific Black person. Right? Um, so all are demonic. Right? Now, for Ellison, this distorting act, which results in a kind of obfuscation of one's racism, is entrenched through habits of seeing and knowing. Uh, as invisible, the Black person's wishes, wants, desires, beliefs, etc., like I said, become irrelevant. Now, at the same time, that kind of invisibility thing is going on. Identity is thrown back onto the Black body in sense of the personhoods defined by whiteness. So it matters not how the black body feels, hears, or sees, but the way in which whiteness posits how the black body feels, hears, sees. What is on the inside is not seen because it is seen. In other words, simultaneously under the white gaze, black bodies are looked upon as both invisible and hypervisible. Now, Franz Fanon explains how epidermal blackness becomes the only salient feature, and all that is known about the black body, all its content, is given in advance. Black is animal, black is ugly, black is lazy, black's evil. And in response to an encounter on a train uh, in which a child expresses fear uh, to the mother over Fanon's black body, this is from chapter five of Black Skin, uh, White Masks. He's talking about riding this train and this little child turns to uh, his mother and says, um, you know, mommy, this, this monster, this black demon is gonna eat me. And, and Fanon says, my body was given back to me, sprawled out, distorted. The tiny white boy throws himself into his mother's arms. Mama, the black monster is gonna eat me up. And black bodies like those of, you know, um, uh, or, you know, Fanon's body posed a threat to this child, even though the child didn't know his personhood. But even Black bodies like the child Trayvon Martin or Emmett Till 
pose a threat to the safe spaces of whiteness, a threat to whiteness as property or a threat to the purity of civilization or something like that. In the uh, short story, Home by Langston Hughes, uh, Hughes tells the story of Roy Williams, a black man who had returned to the US after uh, several years playing violin throughout Europe. And Roy Hughes tells us, quote, had a feeling that he was going to die and he wanted to see his mother again. So returning home, he sensed the white gaze upon his body, a gaze he describes as, quote, not kind, and that made his, quote, skin burn, that, quote, for the first time in half a dozen years made him feel in his very body his color. He was home. So one evening, he encountered the, the local school music teacher, Miss Reese, Mrs. Reese on the street, and the two of them were, you know, politely chatting. And Hughes tells the reader that the two of them smiled at each other. The sick young, this is a quote, the sick young colored man and the aging music teacher in the light of Main Street, end quote. And during the exchange, this movie theater down the road let out and the crowd of white folks storms into the street and they see a black man talking to a white woman. And through the white gaze, what was seen? Well, the crowd, you know, quote, objected to a Negro talking to a white woman, insulting a white woman, attacking a white woman raping a white woman. Mrs. When Mrs. Reese screamed after Roy had been struck, they were sure that he was making love to her. And before the story got to the, um, got beyond the rim of the crowd, Roy had been trying to rape her right there on Main Street in front of the brightly lighted windows of the drugstore, end quote. Now, I'm not going to continue going, you know, reading passages about this white assault on Roy because uh, it's a lot to bear, but I, I do want to read uh, Hughes's final line, quote, when the white folks left his brown body, stark naked, strung from a tree on the edge of town, it hung there all night like a violin for the wind to play, end quote. So Roy's body no longer had breath within, but in the end, Hughes, Hughes describes an air, a spirit from without that, that lets Roy's body become musical. And so what song does that wind play? The earth, the elements, right? What does Roy's body want us to hear? So try to picture the scene. Right? No white person remains. They can't hear his song. They can't carry on his magic. But Hughes gives Roy back his personhood. Roy even is given agency even in death, a kind of melodious agency that asks us to think about the ways in which white supremacy and racism are dehumanizing disease. What were Hughes and Jesse Williams trying to challenge us to understand? And Fanon is useful here in reaching a sociogenic answer. He writes, quote, I am given no chance. I am overdetermined from without. And already I am being dissected under the white gaze, under the white eyes, the only real eyes. I am fixed. Having adjusted their microtomes, they've objectively cut away slices of my reality. I am laid bare. Now, Lewis Gordon, who's a well-known Fanon scholar, describes this as an extension of the study of surfaces, the, the appearance of things. The black body is viewed as abnormal, as having a surface that does not satisfy the, um, the, the, the criteria for personhood or rationality. So Fanon describes the black body as a site of phobogenic reality, by which he means that um, uh, the black body produces anxiety. Whiteness experiences kind of a lack of ataraxia, uh, and it attempts to shield itself by policing the black body. This body has a citationality, has content ascribed to it, thrown upon it, and it's outside the control of any one individual. And this is where thinking about systems of, of domination can be very uh, helpful that the, the weight of white 
a white racist system conditions everyone, like Pecola from Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye, how she internalizes the white gaze and she just seeks the eyes. She seeks to have blue eyes or the eyes of white supremacy. And Fanon says something very similar to, to Morrison in this regard that quotes, in the white world, the person of color encounters difficulties. I apologize, it keeps moving. I'm sorry for that. In the white world, the person of color encounters uh, difficulties in elaborating his body schema. The image of one's body is solely negating. It's an image in the third person. Beneath the body schema, I had created a historical racial schema. The data, the data I, I used were provided not by remnants of feelings or notions of the tactile, vestibular, kinesthetic, or visual nature, but by the other, the white man, one who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, and stories. And as a result, the body schema collapsed, giving way to an epidermal racial schema. Fanon concludes it, I was unable to discover the feverish coordinates of the world. I existed in triple. Now we can consider Fanon's claim as an extension of Ellison or W.E.B. Du Bois. Ellison describes how Black people become invisible as they are other. Du Bois, in his account of double consciousness, describes how Black persons have to combat being invisible to themselves. And Fanon here is adding the idea that Black persons have to sense themselves as something more than serpents, as something uh, embodied with depth. And Fanon's claim is that one ought to strive to construct oneself with an awareness of the points made by both Ellison and Du Bois. That is, to see whites, to see whites see him as a Black body, and to see himself doing both of these. And this requires seeing oneself from the outside, from the third person as a, as a spectator, watching and evaluating an encounter between two others. The uh, ocular centricity of all this leads me to address the state upon which such encounters transpire. Uh, that is the police state, the state of terror, the racial state that does not value real persons embodied in blackness. Williams concluded that BET award speech with the following statement, just because we're magic doesn't mean we're not real. Williams was saying that, yes, we're extremely talented, but we're also vulnerable. We're not objects, we're persons. Human beings are embodied persons and to be alive literally requires breath. Of course, that's quite obvious to, to all of us, I understand, but consider Eric Garner's words as he was choked to death by Staten Island police officer, Daniel Pantaleo. I can't breathe. 11 times, Garner cried out. 11 times, the officer refused to listen. Now, a real person has to have lungs in their, uh, air in their lungs to breathe. For the officer, Garner was an object, just something to be controlled and manipulated however he, however he saw fit. When Eric Harris was shot to death in the back by Tulsa County Deputy Robert Bates, Harris cried out, oh, oh my God, I'm losing my breath. To which Bates's partner, Joseph Breyers said, fuck your breath. Bates, Breyers, no doubt, they knew they were destroying a black body, but what they failed to recognize or take seriously is that they were destroying black life. And this is a problem for racial profiling because it considers criminality before any crime has actually been committed. It's not merely using race as one you know, part of a subject description. Uh, the, if the bodies of color, because of their hypervisibility, are coded as always already guilty regardless of any potential innocence. I mean, throughout the 2000s, millions of people, mostly people of color, were stopped by police officers. Arrest rates, this is, um, uh, arrest rate, excuse me, <clears throat> arrest rates are, you know, roughly equivalent across uh, whites, blacks, and Latinx people. Blacks are frisked at a significantly higher rate than their white peers. Force, on average, is, um, uh, is used 24% of encounters involving black people, but only 17% of those involving white people. 
roughly 1% of frisks actually result in actually the police capturing a weapon. Whites who are frisked are more likely to have a weapon on their person. In other words, whites were found to be in the possession of drugs and weapons at higher rates than people of color. In some, in the event that whites were stopped and frisked and a crime had been committed, it more likely actually be a white person. Put differently, the majority of people who were profiled are the wrong people. There's a 2015 uh, study analyzing the use of racial profiling by the Berkeley, uh, Berkeley, California, the Berkeley Police Department. And that revealed a common pattern of terror. While black citizens were 8% of the population, they composed more than 30% of those stopped by police. Once stopped, the frequency of being searched was five times greater for blacks than it was for whites. But results of these searches revealed just how much whiteness was insulated from its own criminality. Whites received citations at twice the number of blacks. In other words, when stopped, whites are significantly more likely to be found to have broken the law. So let me conclude with this. Uh, the goals of policing are racially coded throughout the history of the US. In short, the police with synergetic power are a means of controlling non-white or Calibanic populations. So the, the racial polity that we say is rooted in social contract theory, or kind of political liberalism, it fails uh, to consider the extent to which the formation of police is inseparable from the emancipation of white liberal subjects. On the one hand, whiteness is associated with order, which the police allegedly seek to secure. And on the other hand, blackness is associated with disorder, which the police seek to hunt down, terrorize, and or remove. So if blackness is a marker of criminality, then all Calibans pose a potential threat. Each black person is likely to be viewed as delinquent, as an enemy of society. And there is a, um, a very sad, sad predictability in the United States, namely that anti-black violence, particularly in terms of policing within a white polity is utterly normative. Thank you.